So first of all, I, I am at a very big disadvantage here. The first reason is following Denise and Michelle's and Nick's presentations. I don't know, they set the bar really high. And with the anchoring her stick, tells me that I have to do really, I have to push myself to, to you know, meet the expectations here. And the second reason I think I'm at a disadvantage is I'm standing between the lunch and you. So I will try to make it as uh, enjoyable as possible. So bear with me for another 30 minutes before the lunch. So today I chose this, this topic, cognitive, uh, combating con cognitive bias as a data scientist. And the reason I choose this is a couple, couple reasons. First of all, um, Danny is one of my um, biggest influencers. I have read, not read, studied his book five times from start to finish. And I must add, it's not an easy read. If you ever tried to read his book, you have to spend a lot of cognitive power to, to understand the concepts. And the second of all, I have come to a point in my career where there is a lot of value data science adds, but it's also limited by the amount of which we can influence the business decision makers and the leaders. And after studying his research and the findings, I have started thinking, how can I put these things in, in real life? How can I put them in use? And the second reason this is important to me is, actually, I'm going to share a story with you. So uh, I have two daughters. Uh, my oldest one is eight years old. Two years ago, uh, I was preparing uh, to, to go to work in the morning, and she was preparing to go to kindergarten. She was six years old uh, back then. And she asked me a question out of blue. And the question was, Daddy, is there a crazy world out there? Well, this morning, I didn't have my morning coffee yet. So if I say no, I know that uh, it's not true. <laughs> if I say yes, I know what's coming. But being a responsible dad, I said, yes, there's a crazy world out there. And came the mother of all questions. Why? So my initial response that I thought was, oh, people are irrational at times. But I'm dealing with a six-year-old here. She probably doesn't know the meaning of irrational at that point. So I substituted another word and said, well, people do stupid things at times. So what's surprising to me after that answer is that she said, like voting? I never thought voting is a stupid activity in, in our democracy, but she thought voting is a stupid activity. So the reason I'm telling you this story is that even the simple talk with a six-year-old actually taught me that there are a lot of heuristics of cognitive bias going on. Maybe a substitution heuristic, maybe um, narrative policy, maybe confirmation bias. It's a very simple talk, and a six-year-old's mind just amazed me during that time that how we actually perceive things. And the reason, actually, she asked whether voting is a stupid activity is because this conversation just ha happened a couple months after the elections in the United States and a couple you know, months after the elections in my home country, Turkey. So she was exposed to a lot of media and discussions and all these things. So seeing such, such a bias in a six-year-old also makes me think that, well, if such a conversation, simple conversation, has so many bias going on, what about our business? What about our you know, day-to-day lives that we spend eight hours, nine hours engaging with a lot of professionals? How many times we're exposed to these bias and how many times we are not even aware of those? So I have been trying to find ways to combat, combat this cognitive bias as a data scientist for the last couple of years at least, uh, by trying to ways to maybe you know, reduce it or, you know, we cannot eliminate it for sure, but at least reduce it or use some of the learnings from Denise research to our advantage. So, in the, in the next couple slides, I'm going to share seven situations that I find useful in my day-to-day in my -day work. Some of the cognitive biases that 
we fight. And uh, I'm going to share some practical advice that I happen to find working. And again, there is no solution that can 100% help us eliminate those. But at least in certain situations, it, it helped me. And I hope it would uh, help you as well. So let's start with the situation one, which is the one that I hate the most. So it's about narrative fallacy and mountains of hypotheses, as I call it. So narrative fallacy, as um, Nicholas Taleb in his Black Swan book introduces us, is um, actually coming from, originating from the fact that we want to rationalize the world. We want to understand the world around us. And it's a constant struggle we have to explain things that, that are evolving around us. So how it is reflected in a business situation is that because of that desire to explain the world and the events, we come up with a bunch of hypotheses for a given situation. So we want to understand the world, and we want to throw you know, a lot of hypotheses around why a certain phenomenon might be occurring. Now, what happens at times is that we, as the data scientists, find ourselves under a mountain of hypotheses. Like anyone in this room can generate 50 times faster then a data scientist can prove or disprove a hypothesis about any subject. So within a, you know, our time frame, we can throw enough hypotheses on data scientists that they can spend weeks to prove or disprove. And I have found myself in, in this situation multiple times as, as well as my, my team of data scientists. So how do we combat this? So I will give you three, three uh, approaches. Um, the first one is skin in the game, the second is random is your friend, and the third one is jigsaw puzzle strategy, as I call it. I don't know if there's a you know, real name for that, but that's what I invented. So let's start with the skin in the game. This is a simple strategy, but I find it very, uh, very helpful. So it's basically si simply asking a question to, to those uh, subject matter experts or business leaders, a question is like, hey, where would you bet your monthly salary? Now, we, we know from, the, from Danny's research that you know, people actually are typically don't like you know, risk, taking risk. So when they are faced with such a hypothetical question, even in the hypothetical sense, they actually tend to navigate towards the hypotheses that actually may provide value. So if you are facing you know, hundreds of hypotheses, asking this question you know, significantly reduces the amount of hypotheses that you know, they really want you to look at. In my experience, it eliminates three quarters of the hypothesis off the bat. Well, if this fails, or sometimes maybe the data scientists who are dealing with the situation is not, you know, is, is um, you know, just a new data scientist, then you can follow a second approach. So you can you can use random is your friend. So in, in this case, what you are doing is you are using data science. You are actually create, taking a data set, which is the actual observed data in this sense. And then you are creating randomly generated covariates, okay? And this technique especially helps when you have a target to predict. Then you build a predictive model to predict the target variable using the actual observed data as well as the random covariates you just introduced. Well, and then you look at the feature importance matrix, and at some point in that matrix, you are going to see that the random covariates pop up. Well, any covariate that is close to the performance of those random variables, you should just ignore the hypotheses that are related to that because the odds of finding a real pattern in those you know, covariates is really, really slim. So if you want to invest your time on the hypothesis that, that will potentially lead into some finding, focus on the ones that are high above. Well, let's say this is not the right approach, and it, it can happen especially in cases where you are looking at a, um, <coughs> not necessarily trading a, but trying to predict a well-defined KPI or, uh, um, or a target variable. But let's say it's more um, vague in the sense that you want to find patterns in the data, not much direction. Well, you can use this strategy to actually create a second approach where you take the top of the data set, which is your actual observed data, you create a copy of it, but you randomly mix the covariates in your data, and you label the first part of the data as actuals, and you label the second part of your data as fake, and put in a decision tree algorithm. 
if the algorithm can differentiate the true, uh, the actuals from the false, that means there's some pattern in it. And the covariates that will help you to separate these two data sets from each other are probably covariates that have some pattern in it. So go after those hypotheses that can actually split the fake from the actual. So these are some defenses that you can use uh, in this situation one. So sometimes there won't be a mountain of hypotheses, but still um, some of the hypotheses that are thrown at you will be you know, drawn from um, some of the you know, uh, intel that uh, the leaders are getting from, from the uh, people in the field. So this is a real situation which happened at Humana. Uh, we have these SNP plans, which are, which are basically dual spatial needs plans uh, that we offer to our members. And uh, we, were, uh, we were observing elevated discernment from these plans. And the market intelligence we were getting was competitors are enriching their um, out of, uh, on, on the counter uh, benefits, basically those you know, uh, drugs that you can just buy without the Rx. So the executive response was, oh, it makes sense. Let's enrich our benefits. And also engage some of our data scientists to look at the situation. So our data science teams actually look at the problem. And what we found in the data set is that, well, our members are not even using the current benefits. So if they are not using the current benefits we are offering, how come this is not sufficient? How, how come we need to further enrich these? So, but, but the problem at this point is that data scientists have to be even more careful because when an executive give, give you a particular belief, particular problem, they actually attach themselves to some extent to, to that belief as well. So next steps for a data scientist becomes very important. So at this stage, the data scientists have to separate the people problem from the material problem. So you have to you know, walk a fine line and communicate very carefully uh, you know, your findings as well as next steps. So simple analysis of the uh, OTC data revealed the benefits, uh, re revealed the benefits already underutilized is, is the finding here. But the data scientists should not stop there because if you stop there, then because of that attachment to the problem, you will be thrown another 100 uh, hypotheses. Hey, did you look at the data this way or that way? Can you find something else here? So you have to actually uh, propose your own hypotheses. So that's kind of the strategy I, I find very uh, helpful because you, as a data scientist, you are being proactive and directing the conversation to the hypotheses where you, you know, the data is showing you. Situation three, um, this is one of my favorites. What you see is all there is. So this is also true in, in, in um, data-driven strategies. So what, what I mean by this slide is very simple, actually. The, when you look at the observed data in the databases, you are actually looking at a conditional data, conditional on your business guardrails, your definition of your buying box, however you name it. So if you were to make different business decisions, you would probably observe a different kind of data in your databases. So what that means is when you ask questions to the available data in your databases, you're actually suffering from this, uh, this effect, what you see is all, all out there effect. So you need to actually go beyond the data and what it tells you. Because if your business is blue, you will, the, the blue uh, square there, you will observe data points that fall on in, inside blue. But if you twist your business and make it the red, then you will observe the data points that fall in, in, in inside the red box. Now I'm going to share a real example uh, from my Capital One years. So I was leading pr national pricing for Capital One, and we wanted to optimize pricing to boost our profits. So the, 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 the first two charts that you are looking at, very textbook, in any economy book, you, uh, you, ca you can find this uh, information. So what you are trying to accomplish here is capture the price elasticity with the first chart. Of course, for you to capture that price elasticity, you cannot do in your observed databases. You have to put a test in place to differentiate your pricing on the horizontal axis so that you can capture the price elasticity. 
next step is maximizing your profit, which is your pricing times you know, the, uh, the, the total demand, given your price point, times uh, the, the value, the profit you are going to make out of it. And it gives you such a curve, right? When you decrease the price, it, you, know, you are, you are uh, cutting uh, from your profits. When you increase the price, at some point, you are losing from the demand. And there's an optimal point. And if you actually put a data scientist on this kind of a problem, yeah, you can optimize and reach that optimal data point if you know enough about statistical model building and optimization. That was the first part I accomplished when I first joined the company. Now, it gets very interesting when you actually start to think outside of the box. Is there a way I can do better than that data point? Now, given the data available in our databases, the answer is no, right? But the answer is yes. If you go beyond what you observe in the data set, you can. So this brings us to the, to the third graph. So in this graph, what you are looking at is the black one is your efficient frontier uh, given the observed data in your databases. The second, the, the red one, is demonstrating another efficient frontier if you actually go beyond the observed data in your databases. Just, if, what if you twist your business card wheels? What if you combine not only data, set, uh, the data science or the techniques, modelings that you can use with something else, with maybe sales? What if you deploy your sales to promote your pricing to the customers? What if you let them aware of you will be giving the most competitive price out there? You are combining a different business strategy with the power of data science. And what you are looking at is not only you are making more profit, you are actually capturing a larger market share which makes your business even more robust because any kind of deviation in the old will cause you to lose more money. Any deviation in the, in the second one is more robust because you are not going to deviate from your optimal point because it's flatter. So looking beyond what data tells you in your existing databases is very powerful. Situation number four, anchoring. It's a very uh, powerful heuristic actually, and uh, I use this as a defense mechanism uh, a lot of times. Like, yeah, there are a couple examples here. The first one is about communicating a model performance. So any data scientist you know, can build a model and communicate the performance, but the way you communicate makes a difference sometimes. So this is from, an, uh, from a uh, real example again. We build a model and the model was doing only 20% better than random. So when you show that uh, uh, result that way to the business, they say, only 20% better than random? Well, that sucks. But here's the thing. Even the best model, the perfect model you can ever build can only uh, do 30% better than random. So if you tell the business that we are actually 90% close to the perfect model, you get a so different reaction. And the way you anchor them is basically you know, very different from the first situation. The second is from, uh, you know, I, I heard a lot from the, especially the junior data scientists. How do I manage the expectations and the, you know, uh, uh, the deadlines with my business partners? Well, the naive data scientists basically go and say, when do you need it by? And the answer is yesterday. Whereas if they go and say, hey, how about if I deliver this by June 15? Then the negotiation happens around that time. So that's another defense mechanism. So I, I, um, I have taken some classes in Southern Methodist University about negotiation. And one of the professors that, that was giving the negotiation class asked him, tell me some resources about negotiation. And this was you know, one of the movies. He said, like, if, if, if you like movies, you, you have to watch this movie. And this is from Thank You for Smoking Movie. Um, and Aaron Hackett here is playing the role of a um, um, lobbyist for uh, cigarette companies. I don't know if you watched the movie, but this is a hilarious scene. He's, he's actually sitting next to people who are against him and who are against cigarette uh, smoking. And during the, the uh, beginning of the show, he just immediately raises his hands and jump on the discussion. And after that, he controls the whole situation. 
And at the end, everyone was, was sympathetic of the cigarette companies and the lobbies just sitting there. So why I'm bringing this up is not, I'm not you know, saying that cigarettes is good, but when data scientists, when they engage with, with businesses, if they you know, start speaking first, if they're engaging with the business leaders first, they are actually, they have significant you know, influence in the room than if they just sit silent and wait and act later. Confirmation bias. So this is one of the, I think, worst biases of our mind because um, uh, our minds, so we whenever we are given a situation, we want to, if we want to understand the situation, we have to first believe in the situation. That's how Danny defines in the book. And for us to unbelieve it requires our system to, to engage. We have to like spend a lot of cognitive power to unbelieve the situation. But along the process, we are basically trying to confirm the situation, confirm the, the statement, rather than trying to deny it or, or uh, um, unbelieve it. So, and this happens a lot, actually. Whenever you are, you know, uh, when a business partner, you know, tells you a hypothesis, they want to believe it. And your job becomes, how do I make them to unbelieve it? And it's very difficult. So there are uh, some strategies uh, I have actually, I didn't come up with this strategy all myself, I just studied the book again five times, and you know, these are two that I find helpful. The first one I call it morning, evening, or Monday, Friday strategy. Um, so again, for us to unbelieve the statements, we need cognitive power. And whenever we need, to, we need our business uh, partners to unbelieve something, if you are scheduling a meeting on a Friday, 4 p.m., where everyone is depleted, well, good luck. So whenever you need some, uh, some of the cognitive power to be put into the you know, thinking process, make sure you are scheduling those engagements, meetings, um, you know, during the times where people will be more likely to spend their, their brain power. And whenever you want the opposite, go with the opposite. The second one is take advantage of a uh, positive test strategy. Again, this is from uh, Daniel's book. Rather than asking a question in a, in, in, a, in a certain way, you can ask in the opposite way, right? So in this, uh, again, in this OTC uh, benefit problem, is current OTC benefit a problem? When you ask this, you're, again, your mind believes in that and you, now you have to unbelieve it, right? Versus if you ask it in a way that is current OTC benefit rich enough, then you believe in that and you need to, the burden is to actually unbelieve it, right? So as a data scientist, if you have sufficient evidence towards one direction, go with the way of framing the uh, question in a way that you want people to believe. It will make easier to convince them with the support of the data uh, afterwards. Situation six, halo effect. This is a very common and very powerful bias. I think this is super important, but I think it is leveraged less by the data scientists and there are a couple ways it can be leveraged, but one of the things that I always tell to my data scientists when they first join my team is that when you go in a meeting with our business partners, when you find yourself in you know, uh, a new project kickoff meeting, I want you to be very active. I want you to be you know, very talkative, very positive, because that's the, that's the time the data scientists can create that halo effect with the business partners, rather than bringing challenges, bring possible solutions. Rather than being very silent and inactive, be very active. So creating that halo effect in the first meeting is very powerful. Because what happens is that when the data scientists speak with the business units, uh, the business partners, executives, 
the executives start to believe in them, start to establish that trust. And what follows after that is throughout the project, that trust, that mutual relationship is super helpful to get things done. But the problem is a data scientist's uh, first preference is to stay silent because we want to learn more. We want to get the facts more before we start engaging. That's, that's how, how we are defined. It's a, we are more um, introverts than extroverts. I'm an introvert, but I push myself every single day when I go to work to become an extrovert. Because the more I communicate, the more I establish those good relationships, strong bonds in the first meeting, that halo effect goes a long way. And this is the last situation I would like to communicate. So these charts are just representative. We don't track our employees' performance like this. But let, you know, there are two scenarios, employer, uh, employee A and employee B. Employee A is a very predictable, very you know, above average performance. And employee B has a very sporadic um, performance. Well, let's do this. I, let me ask you this question. Which employee would you, would you promote? Who, who would promote employee A? Who would promote employee B? Interesting. Okay. So if I were to make the decision based on these data, I would definitely promote employee, employee A. And the reason is, well, employee A is, is dependable, predictable, delivers constant performance. And if you actually do the math and ca calculate the area under the curve, the sum of the total performance, as a data scientist, I, it's better than employee B. Like, you, you should do the math, but I guarantee you, area under the curve for employee A is higher. But throughout my career, I observed that in many instances, we promote employee B. Now, why is that? Now, what we learned from, again, Danny's book, Experience and Memory, page 378. <laughs> I told you I studied the book five times. We tend to remember the spikes and the recent experiences. And those spikes and recent ex experiences that we observe with employee B actually leads us to promote them especially given they do those picks in the right time, then they are the visible employees, they are the A players, they are the, the, the you know, most valuable employees. But in fact, you are relying on their sporadic performance. What if they start to underperform during a time where you need them the most? But this is typically what I observed in, uh, in my career at least, where the promotions go. Not all, all the time, of course. Um, and I just want to share this with you because I think this is very important. If you want to build the really strong data science teams that we can always rely on as leaders, we need to make sure that we are promoting the right employees that we can depend, trust, over, over and over, you know, uh, across time. So I don't know if there's any HR system that can track this kind of information, which I don't believe so. But what I encourage you is that be aware of the, the heuristic that you, that you have. You're going to be always looking for spikes and the most recent experiences. And be aware of that and protect your employee A's. They are actually your greatest assets. With that, thank you very much.